13th, um, in Arizona, since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, we have lost 17,438 lives. Our case rates continue to climb, climb a little bit. We're at 871,000 cases. And the best news is that our vaccine rates also continue to climb. We have five administered 5,431,712 vaccines. So we are approaching herd immunity. The news that uh, yesterday that the Pfizer ACIP has recommended and approved the recommendation that Pfizer can be now administered to individuals age 12 and up is huge news, um, especially for herd immunity, because that getting those younger, uh, those adolescents in and immunized is gonna help us approach herd immunity levels. That's the big news this week. And we will hear a really brief update about that from Dr. Peggy Stemmler. Next week, Dr. Karen Lewis from the Arizona Department of Health Services is gonna join us and provide a comprehensive uh, overview of Pfizer for kids and also go over the other uh, adolescent immunizations. Also new this week, Moderna packaging is changing. You will start seeing 14 dose vials and 10 dose vials uh, from your Moderna. And remember, we're all ordering our Moderna directly from ASIS right now. Another reminder, um, we went over this last week, but just remember that VFC, you're no longer getting those courtesy, your order is approved emails. You actually have to go into uh, the orders to check and see if that order was approved. We'll send these slides out after the, after the meeting, but it does have screenshots on how you can check to see if the order was approved. So we'd love to hear, um, Peggy, if you want to tell us a little bit about, about immunizing adolescents. Um, and if you have questions about this, feel free to chat them in or just unmute yourself and ask Peggy directly. Sure, thanks. Um, no, I appreciate this opportunity. Uh, so of course, this is like happy news. As Rebecca said um, earlier this week, the FDA amended that emergency use authorization for the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine to include, previously it was um, 16 and older, and now we're down to 12 years of age and older, which is really, um, is, you know, again, great news. And the committee, Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices from CDC went ahead and made that recommendation quickly. Um, the The... Great news. So the studies on this, so remembering that the baseline studies for, you know, Pfizer vaccine in human beings were, were on about, oh, 30,000 people. And in the interim, it has been used, you know, being used on millions. And so with all of the safety monitoring data that's already, you know, existing in just the general adult population, the questions really that they're looking at is, are there anything different? Is there anything different about the way, you know, for whatever reason this might work in teens and are continuing to study with children actually down to the age of six months old, which is not ready yet, but that will be coming probably in the fall. But they looked at about 2,250 um, uh, teens in this age group in a randomized controlled study. So looking at, you know, placebo versus vaccine and really, uh, again, found that same sort of, um, actually sort of slightly better e efficacy in teens than in um, adults. In fact, the observed efficacy was 100% for people, whether or not they had had evidence of previous COVID infection. So that's pretty good. Now it's a small group. So there will probably end up being around, you know, somewhere between the 94 that we're seeing in adults and 100% in the end. But basically it works in kids, just like it does in these teens as it does in adults. And the side effect profiles were, were pretty similar to the young adults, those people who are 16 to 25 years old, Mostly, you know, local reactions at the site where you got the injection, you know, pain, maybe a little bit of um, inflammation there, 
that was most prominent after that first dose. And um, after that, the other things that were more common after the second dose were more systemic reactions like fatigue or headaches. You know, some people had chills and muscle pain, fever, maybe some joint pain. Again, those side effects, you know, went away after, you know, uh, 48 to 72 hours. And really, um, there are, there were no, you know, nothing that you, we would not expect from the experience that we've had with COVID uh, thus far. So um, again, works well, nothing really different than our current experience. And I think the, the key thing um, is that it's just going to be um, hopefully being able to get these kids back both for their COVID vaccines, but also as much as possible for if they've been missing well care and that just general health supervision through the course of the pandemic. Um, this is a great opportunity to get, um, get folks into the office. This is not an official thing yet, but perhaps by next week. Um, I know CDC, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practice is discussing um, the policy right now is not to administer COVID vaccine within two weeks of any other vaccine. So that's before or after, but that is actually under discussion and um, you know, that, that policy may change. Um, there was kind of an unofficial statement just you know, an hour ago. It is not the official statement, but, but we'll be looking out for that very carefully. So, but for now, they now for right now we don't co-administer with other uh, with other teen vaccines, but we expect that will hopefully change in the next few weeks. Yes. Okay. Um. So I, uh, if a child is disabled and doesn't have any arms, so can you put it somewhere else? Yeah. You know, for adults and and older kids. Um, the deltoid, that upper arm muscle, is the most commonly used site. But if you think about how you administer vaccines to younger kids, the question is, um, do you have a needle length that will give that intramuscular injection? But as long as it's in a nice big muscle, yes, you can use other um, muscles like uh, the, the outside of the thigh like we do for infants. Um, rear ends, you know, there are other locations that you can uh, use an intramuscular injection. As long as the needle's long enough. Yeah, you gotta get, you gotta get beyond the fat and the subcutaneous tissue. <laughs> Anybody else have other questions about uh, Pfizer going to 12? So what are we telling people that have heard vaccine will stop them from having children down the line? You know, that is a great question that has come up. I will put in the chat kind of a, a myth buster um, website when I, when I can like actually not have to do two things at once. But this, this kind of very theoretical concern, oh, here we go, Laura, thank you. Put, put in that um, piece. But this is a kind of a theoretical concern about the way that the vaccine happens. It is not something that is true, but I will give you a link to some like talking points on exactly how to address that, that particular issue. We know it's out there along with other vaccine myths. Yeah, and ACOG has done some things on that as well, the American College of obstetricians and gynecologists too. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right, well, if you think of one, go ahead and put it in the chat uh, and we'll do a good deep dive next week with Dr. Lewis. We know that a lot of you, um, so for now you're still requesting your Pfizer from your counties. We know that many of our vaccine providers um, who are doing events are still you know, tweaking your workflows so that you can start accepting Pfizer and are only getting Moderna and J&J. &J. So what our, our ask is for you is that if you are hosting a Moderna event or only administering Johnson & Johnson, 
please ask your patients if they have children ages 12 years and older. And we know that a lot of them will bring those kids right with them. Uh, a lot of pediatricians and family physicians offices have Pfizer. They ordered it last week and they were ready to go. And, and today are, are maybe even administering it to their patients. So ask your patients who are getting Moderna or J&J, &J, do you have a 12 year old uh, or a child who's 12 or older? And if yes, tell them to call their doctor to, to learn about the Pfizer vaccine. Pfizer is also available at, at a lot of local pharmacies, Walgreens, CVS, um, Safeway, Fry's. The state pods, which are in multiple communities throughout the state are also doing Pfizer. Uh, they have accept registrations online, um, but are also still accepting walk-ins. And then check with your county on on um, Pfizer events that they're that they're holding. I think we know of five or six counties, rural counties that also have Pfizer right now. So if you live in a community that hasn't had Pfizer yet, you may wanna check in with your county to see if you have it or what their plans are um, for bringing it to kids if you're not able to keep it in your office. All right. So please get those kids in there. We all are chasing herd immunity together. So even if you can't, if you can't immunize a child, send them somewhere that can. And I'm, I stopped sharing my screen and we are gonna spend the rest of our time today talking with Maggie uh, from ADHS about ACEs. So Maggie, just take it away. And Maggie, if you're talking, you're still on mute. We see your screen, but we don't hear you. Awesome. I was trying to find the unmute button. Hello, everyone. My name is Maggie Macias, and I am the ACEs Enhancement Support Analyst at the Arizona Department of Health Services. Today, I will be covering ACEs. This is just a disclaimer, as of Monday, May 3rd, Moderna vaccines ordering is available in ACEs for providers with approved pandemic provider onboarding submission. Um, we, I was also just told that Janssen will be available for ordering as of May 17th. Pfizer vaccines will continue to be allocated by state and local health departments while supplies remain limited. ACEs. ACEs is our state immunization database used to record and administer doses and track vaccine inventory. Regardless of what you are using HR, we want you to account for your doses and report them to ACEs. I will cover right now what it is to report directly into ACEs. I'll walk you through searching and adding editing patients' records. So when you log into ACEs, you want to go ahead and locate the patient tab on the left-hand side. Select the search and add. You want to enter the patient's name that you are searching in the search bars and the date of birth and select search on the right-hand side. Once you select search, the patient research result that we search. We will now select the patient. When we select the patient, it brings up the patient demographic. We will then navigate to vaccination tab on the left-hand side and select view and add. This populates the patient's record. As you can see the vaccine, the date that the vaccine was administered. You can also see contraindications here which the contraindication definitions are listed above. Sometimes if you hover over here on the red, it would also give you the contraindications definitions here. How to add a vaccine into ACEs. You wanna make sure that you're selecting the correct vaccine that you administered that day and the correct date. You can double click on the vaccine on the icon here and it will generate that date. For example, if it was 513, double click and it would appear 513. You wouldn't have to manually enter it. Of course, it is an option to manually enter it. If it was a historical vaccine, you would select add historical on the right-hand side. 
But in this scenario, we're gonna go ahead and say we had administered this vaccine. So we're gonna select added administered. Once you select add administered, the VC eligibility dropdown appears. You'll select the eligibility and select continue. Once you select continue, you'll see the vaccination detail page appear. You will then select click to select and these are the lot, num lot numbers available to you. Now, if the lot number does not appear here in this dropdown, that means that you have not received your inventory in ACEs. So you would have to receive your inventory in ACEs in order for these lot numbers to populate here so you can automatically select them and it can populate in the vaccination detail ad page. Once you select that lot, you'll see that it populates all the information here, the vaccine name, you wanna make sure that the data administrator is correct, the manufacturer lot number, facility and funding. Once you verify the information, you wanna select save. If you need to edit the vaccine, for example, um, it was an incorrect date, it should have been the 30th, you can double click the vaccine that is in question. This will give you the page, it will prompt you to either edit or delete the record. Again, you can only edit and delete vaccines that your facility administered. If another facility administered this vaccine, you will not be able to edit or delete the record. You will need to contact that facility to edit the record. Once you select to edit the record, again, it will ask you the VFC eligibility. You'll select the VFC eligibility and select continue. As you can see here, you either can select a different lot by selecting clear and select a new lot number to add into the patient's vaccination detail page. And I think I'm frozen. Can you guys hear me? Yep, we hear you. Okay, awesome. And once you've updated that information, you'll just hit the submit changes located on the right hand side. So this is manual direct entry into ACEs. The experience is completely different for a reporter that's using either HL7, EMR, VMS. In order to have a successful HL7 data transfer from your EMR to ACEs, you wanna make sure that you meet all these bullet points here, which I'll cover. You wanna make sure that you're sending the correct funding source, the correct VFC eligibility, or non-VFC eligible, you gotta make sure that you are sending the correct vaccine code, NDC, CPT, CVX, manufacturer, lot number from the box. All this information here, you can locate outside the box. Again, not the vial, but the box. And you do not wanna be sending unknown, missing or incorrect information. Your vaccines will not decrement. Everything has to mirror exactly with what you have listed in ACEs to your EHR. Funding source again. This is something that we see very common for COVID-19 vaccines. The incorrect funding source is being selected. I have provided a link here for providers to provide to their EMR vendors if you are, um, don't have the capability of selecting um, pandemic or you don't have the capability of sending the correct CVX code over or it's not mapped correctly. It's a little bit more detailed in this flyer and we will add the link in the chat. But again, please make sure you're sending the correct funding source for your vaccines. So today we're gonna to go through some examples and we're gonna troubleshoot to see um, ACEs inventory issues. When you have issues in ACEs, I recommend using our ACEs reports, which is called, one of the reports is called patient detail report. This report can show you the doses that didn't decrement. The lot usage and recall report shows you the doses that decremented. You wanna use our ACEs reports and compare them to your dose accountability logs. And sometimes your EMRs do have logs that you can use. If you don't have access to those EMR dose accountability logs, you're more than welcome to use, use ours. In upcoming slides, I will provide the link for those accountability logs. So let's go through the patient detail report. When you're running the patient detail report, you wanna make sure you select by service, vaccination date range. I do not recommend more than 30 days because ACEs will time out. 
you want to make sure you select active and inactive. If the patient has gone somewhere else, but you administered that vaccine, you still want it to appear in your report. You want to select all and export the report. If you export the report located on the right hand side here, you see this will generate the report in Excel format, which it's easier to filter. In upcoming slides, I'll show you how the PDF format looks. But as of now, let's go ahead and look at the Excel format. As you can see here, we have um, the manufacturer. The manufacturer that was sent over here is Novartis. Novartis does not make rotavirus vaccine. So the type, this type of vaccine is pentavalent, which is made by Merck. So again, the manufacturer code should have been MSD and the incorrect manufacturer code was sent over. This will cause your inventory not to decrement. Another example here that was sent over, the manufacturer was SKB. SKB is for glycosamethylcline, but it is made by Merck, which the correct manufacturer code is MSD. Um, again, um, if you send unknown, it also will not decrement from your ACES inventory. Lot number typos. As you can see here, S and five look very similar, S and five here. So be very careful. This example here, it looks like I went a little too heavy with the sixes. The next example, the lot number is missing. Again, your ACES inventory will not decrement. Common errors that we see is five or S, two or Z, four or A, G or six, one or, one or I, Z, zero and O. Again, I'll give you a tip, it's always gonna be zero. And transpose number, extra numbers of letters, writing NDC numbers instead of lot numbers, getting the actual lot number from the vial instead of the actual box, or sending the diluent information instead of what's on the box for the lot number. And I did want to show you the PDF format. Um, as you can see here, I preferably like using this report because it tells me, did it decrement? Yes or no. And then I can go across and see why didn't it decrement. The funding source is missing. Or maybe the incorrect funding source. It doesn't say PAN, but it says VFC for a COVID vaccine. So this would tell me this was the reason why it did not decrement. The lot usage and recall report. You want to make sure you select state reports, lot usage and recall report, and this is the lot usage and recall report parameters. You want to make sure you select the vaccine that is in question, select the arrow, and select create report. This is the lot usage and recall report, but we're going to take a look at it a little bit more closely. You wanna look at the report to see if there's any clues. For example, I can see it's very common for my vaccines to be full, but for some reason, this is a double dose. So this would let, make me think, is this accurate? I need to go check my dose accountability logs and see if it really was a double dose or a full dose. Colby got on at like at 7.45 this morning and registered either for his We're gonna ask if someone can go ahead and mute themselves. Thank you. The lot usage and recall report here also gives you information where total of patients we have four, but as you can see, it says we administered five. This is when we start thinking critically. Did Minnie Mouse really come back to get HPV9 vaccine? This is, this is when it's perfect to go back to your dose accountability logs and compare to see what really happened. And here are the two to compare next to each other. We have the lot usage and recall report on the left-hand side and the dose accountability log on the right-hand side. As you can see on my dose accountability log, I logged Minnie Mouse once. So this tells me that this is probably incorrect and I would have to go back into ACEs and remove one of the vaccines so that way my inventory is correct. Another example here, we have Buzz and Briar on our dose accountability log, but we do not have them in our report, lot usage and recall report. Again, we would go back into ACEs and record these vaccines for these two patients. Here are the accountability logs that I keep um, discussing. I will go ahead and put the link in the chat for 
those two dose accountability logs. Eventually, they both capture the same data. It's either by, you wanna do it by dose or track individual by a lot. So now we're ready to reconcile an inventory. In order to locate the reconcile inventory page, you'll wanna go ahead and locate lot numbers tab, reconciliation, and this is our reconciliation tab. I recommend that you select print. This will print out a reconciliation worksheet, which you can take directly to your fridge and compare what, with what ACES says you have on hand to what you physically have in your fridge. Again, sometimes the numbers can become a little bit off by one or two, which is fine due to HL7 can take up to 24 hours for it to decrement or reach ACEs from your EHR. When reconciling your inventory, you want to make sure that you look for red flags. Is there any expired doses, excessive lot numbers? This is when we think critically. Maybe I'm ordering too much and this is why I'm having too much expired doses. As well, remember um, if the HL7 data transfer might not be working, maybe the vaccines are not moving. The same number says I have 100 COVID vaccines for the past two weeks and it has not moved. This is a red flag when you wanna contact your EHR vendor and um, ACES to let us know that something might be broken between the interface connection. Expired doses. If you have expired doses, you wanna make sure you're submitting a wasted and expired return form. I also will provide a link here in the chat for this form. Um, just order less or more often to prevent dose expiring. The CDC does send us a report to IPO and it shows what you actually shipped back and shows us what you put in the return form so they should match. Expired doses, um, how to adjust them in ACEs. As you can see here, I had 12 doses that are expired. I physically do not have these doses because I am shipping them back. So I need to make sure I enter in physical inventory zero. As you can see, the adjustment made it to negative 12, which that's correct because I have no vaccines for this lot number. And I would select the category and reason as expired. For COVID-19 negative doses, and you can sell in your ACEs inventory for Pfizer vaccines prior to February 15. Again, I'll go ahead and add that link in the chat for correcting COVID-19 only negative doses. Reconciling wasted doses. In this example, I had 10 vaccines and I spilled or dropped one. So this means 10 minus one, nine. So we go into our physical inventory and say, I physically have nine. The adjustment here should read one. The wasted, broken, drop, and spilled, and we will send the wasted and expired form to IPO. If you need to inactivate lot numbers with zero doses left, this is once you have verified that you no longer have available vaccines for this lot number, and you're, there's no pending HL7 message or vaccines transferring over from your EHR to ACEs, you are 100% positive this is zeroed out, you can go ahead and move to the right-hand side and inactivate the lot number. As you can see here, you just wanna copy what you have quantity on hand to your physical inventory. Of course, we have our wasted um, expired uh, vaccine here. Yes, you're probably wondering why are we just gonna copy everything exactly from what we have quantity on hand to physical inventory, if that might be off by one or two, you will get a chance when we place an order to actually tell us what you physically have in your fridge. Again, this is for the reason that HL7 does take 24 hours. So this can be off by nine. So that's why we give you an opportunity to tell us exactly how, you, how much you have in the orders page. And I will let you know in the upcoming slides where we enter that information. Again, quantity on hand, copy it over to physical inventory, adjust what needs to be adjusted for your expired, and we are ready to submit our monthly inventory to IPO. Ordering in ACEs. 
To order in ACES, you want to locate the orders and transfer tab on the left hand side, select create view orders and select create order. Once you select create order, it will navigate to the orders page. You want to make sure that you're selecting the correct order set for the vaccines that you are ordering. You cannot select three at the same time to order for flu or a pandemic or VFC. It's only one per order. So you will select your order, verify your times of shipping. If you have a temporary hours, if your office will be closed for temporarily, make sure you adjust your hours so the shipment does not come to your facility as well. Verify the address. When placing your order, you wanna make sure you enter the quantity here and here in the comments is where we discussed where you tell us what you physically have in your fridge. Once you enter all this criteria into the required fields, you'll wanna go ahead and submit the order to ACES. I did wanna cover data loggers briefly. Data loggers, you wanna make sure you email your data loggers, but you wanna set up your data loggers prior to receiving your vaccines. VFC providers submit monthly with orders. COVID-19 providers submit upon request. Uh, it must be in data format. PDF is not a data format, and you may submit directly from log tab application. VFC orders may be canceled if data logger reports aren't submitted with your order when upon requested. We are now ready to receive our inventory in ACEs. We wanna make sure that we are receiving our doses in ACEs by logging in and to the orders tab, transfer, create the orders and select the arrows for inbound order transfers. Again, I know that in the previous training, uh, we want step-by-step, step, so I've gone ahead and added those slides. So I will walk you through step-by-step by, step by receiving your orders. On the left-hand side, you'll click orders and transfers, create view order. You'll select the inbound transfer here on the arrow. You'll want to enter your receipt quantity. Once you enter your receipt quantity, you want to verify the information in your orders detail, the quantity, the manufacturer, the lot number, and expiration. Again, I just want to bring attention to the expiration date. ACEs may show 2069, so please verify this information. This is mainly for Moderna, so I have added the link here um, so you can verify the expiration date, and we will also add that link in the chat. And we are ready to receive our vaccine. We have verified lot number expiration, receive. Again, this is very important. If you do not receive your orders in ACEs and you start administering your vaccines to your patients, this will cause decrementing issues. If you do start administering vaccines to your patients before, before receiving them in ACEs, please immediately call the ACEs help desk to assist you. Printing patients records. How to print your patient's record. You wanna go ahead and locate the patient's search and add. You want enter the patient that you are wanting to locate the patient record for. Once you select or enter the patient information, you select search, and in the patient search results, you find your patient and select them. You'll go to reports tab, select state reports, patient record. You will choose whatever you prefer here. I prefer the table borders in my vaccination record and I will select create report. This is the patient vaccination record. As you can see, it provides us the organization information who's printing the information, the patient's information, date of birth, um, address, guardian, et cetera. And we have the vaccine that was administered and the, when the dose was administered. Some exciting news coming soon is we have MyR Mobile. It's free registration. You can actually print official records from the MyR Mobile, meaning your phone, computer, tablet, from any device and any time. So this information will be updated hopefully on our ACES homepage for more details, but it will be easier to access your records. The Reminder Recall, just briefly wanted uh, to go over it. It is a very helpful tool in ACEs. You, the Reminder Recall, you can locate it under the Reminder Recall tab. 
you'll select reminder recall, you'll select for all the patients you own, you'll wanna select the patient age range. You have the ability on this page to select if the patient is inactive or deceased, instead of going individually into each patient's record, it allows you to do it here all at once for all your multiple patients. You can also submit or export the list. Um, if you export the list, it has a different presentation than actually the next slide that I'll present. So I recommend trying both. When you submit it, we have the generate a patient's list. Again, it will be a different presentation than the previous slide for export. So whichever method you prefer, you can try both. We also see here in the green, when, we, when it populates in green, we see that there's 681 patients available to send a reminder recall. We have 555 addresses and we have 462 direct lines. We have 113 cell phone numbers and we have 138 emails. So this is a very helpful tool that you can use to remind your patients. You can either, again, send them postcards, send them emails, call them directly, print out letters, or generate the list. And that is all for me today. If you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat or unmute yourself. Thank you so much. All right, we do have a couple questions and I know that you went over some of these things. So you might be able to show your slides again and be able to show us screenshots. But um, so the first one that came in, when, when ordering vaccines, can the request, can, are we able to request a certain product or amount? when they order through ACES? Meaning like if it's J&J um, um, &J or Moderna? Correct. Um, let me, I, I would have to verify to see if they can select a certain type of vaccine. And quantity, they can always put um, in the comments if they need an additional amount and they have to put the reasoning why. Okay. Um, Actually, we, we'll be sure to provide that next week because did you say on your first slide that they'll be ordering Pfizer and J&J &J through ACES soon too? Yeah, so then I'm guessing they might be able, but let me just verify that. I don't want to confirm that. Yeah, so we'll definitely confirm that next week then. Um, if our clinic integrates, will it automatically integrate COVID vaccine too? And I think that means they already put their VFC things, already go over. Will the COVID automatically go over? Um, they would have to send the correct information for like the CVX code, the NDC number, all the pandemic um, funding storage eligibility for that vaccine if they already have an EHR set up. And they can always email the ACES group one and I can send them the helpful resource for COVID vaccines submitting vaccines to us. So they don't, it doesn't automatically just go over if they already have it set up for VFC? If they automatically have it set up, the, if they have already the vaccine accepted in ACEs, it should go over. If they receive the vaccine in ACEs. Okay, so you have to receive the vaccine in ACEs to make sure that it goes over. Yes. Okay. Um, what if a patient's name is not there or there are two names? I think that was if the patient's name is not in ACEs. So Can you repeat that question again? What if a patient's name is not there or there are two names? A duplicate, um, they would report that to the ACEs help desk so we can merge the record together. Okay. Hi, uh, Valentin here. May I yes. add to that? Uh, so if there are no results, you can uh, be more specific in the search. Uh, to try to find that patient. If nothing uh, actually uh, populates as a result, no matter how much information you put, you can always add that as a new patient. There's a check, check, uh, check box uh, below the search that you can check and uh, with adding additional information, you can add as a new patient. If there are two results and maybe they're not uh, duplicates, you can always open one, uh, one by one and verify the address. That might help. Okay. Thanks. 
there was a question about how to account for when you have extra doses in the vial. And just to let you know, the job aid for fixing inventory when you have those extra doses is in the chat. And we'll make sure to, to send that out um, afterwards as too. Here's a question that came up last week when you were on vacation, Maggie. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we're having a problem with the PHC hub. There's no selection choice or tab for stock report to access the detail error report. Do you have a timeline for when the hub will be up and running? I, I believe they're saying the scheduled report. Um, so yes, that is a known issue and we've reported it to our vendor. Again, they can access those reports to create the reports at that moment, but again, you can't schedule them. So, but you're in terms of the timeline, you're waiting from the vendor for confirmation about when it'll be fixed. Yes, it's all on the vendor right now. Okay, thanks. Um, if everything looks correct on the EHR side, but the patient does not appear on ACES, should we just enter manually, even though our EHR should have communicated that to ACES? Where is that question? I want to read that question again. Elva, it's from Elva Hooker. It's about, I don't know, maybe midway through the log right now or my log right now. Yeah, this is Elva. I just um, <laughs> I was trying to, um, it, I look over, you know, based on the PowerPoint slides, you know, everything looks correct as it was entered, but it doesn't decrement um, in the um, ACES and the patient's information, it looks correct. But then when I go, I could go in and edit manually, it seems to decrement, but I don't want to double duplicate work if, and it come back to, you know, right. Um, Alba, if you could send me an email, I can actually look at the HL7 message and see why it didn't decrement and we can troubleshoot that. All right, thank you. Hey. So next question, what happens when they are not on the lot usage report, but are in ACES? They are in ACES, but they're not on the report. Uh, I would have to look at the parameters, how they're running their report. Um, Valentin, is there any other? Yeah, uh, I wanna add that uh, patients that show up on the lot usage and recall report, uh, those are the patients that, those, those are decremented from the inventory. So if they are in ACEs, but not showing up on, the, uh, on that report, that means that that shot, that those did not decrement from the inventory. So we can uh, troubleshoot why that didn't happen. I should let you know each time that happened, this is Pam. You can email the ACES help desk and they can help you troubleshoot to see um, what is being sent over to ACES from your EHR. Okay. You can also run, you can also run patient detail report and the patient detail report will uh, kind of indicate uh, which eligibility was sent, which funding source, uh, which lot number, if there's a typo uh, in the lot number or manufacturer. So you can try to, to pinpoint the, uh, the a reason there. If not, you can always contact us. Yeah, it's because it's kind of weird because I'll do um, I'll do the um, set it up for the certain lot number and everything else. Do like twenty of them, but you know five of them don't show up in the lot usage report. The rest of them do. So I don't know. So yeah, on the patient detail report, just to piggy piggyback off Valentine, that is a very helpful report to tell you exactly. Um, it'll, it'll indicate like you know like the funding sources missing. I don't know what slide it was that I presented it in, but it will tell you funding source missing or funding source was attached incorrectly or the lot number typo was incorrect or eligibility is missing. All those take into account why your vaccines don't decrement. So if you troubleshoot the patient detail report and you're still having issues, feel free to email the ACES help desk so we can help you troubleshoot further. Okay, thank you. Uh, I also want to add that it, it will also depend when you run that report. You mentioned, uh, uh, administering 20 vaccines and 15 show up, five didn't. Right. Uh, if you're running reports like the same day, there is a chance that those five just ended up in either in manual deduplication queue or uh, ambig ambiguous ID that we need to process. Uh, and after that, after we process it, our overnight, there are overnight processes that run in ACES and just um, 
sorts out the data in the proper uh, table in the background of ACES. So uh, at most 24 to 48 hours after the administration, after sending the data, the data should be uh, all in proper places. If not, then definitely there's something uh, something wrong. Yeah, it's usually when I'm trying to figure out why my lot my lot use um, my reconciliation amounts are not correct is when I'm usually looking for it. So it's not usually that soon after I put them in. But thank you. So Amy said I submitted an expiration date for the Moderna vaccine as 2069. How can I change that after I already submitted what was received? They can have their um, either they can go back into their EHR and resubmit it again so it updates, but they have to make sure they're updating that expiration date in ACEs as well and in their EHR. All right. Um, there was misreported wasted do wasted doses. They were marked as dropped or spilled. How do we add those doses back into our inventory? Um, this is more dose accountability. I would probably have to call the ACEs help desk to have them walk them through to correct the issues. Thanks. And that and that's in the chat too, the help desk. I think you all know how to get a hold of the help desk anyway. So uh, if they have, a, this is a response to one of the earlier questions about um, if we have the interface already for EMR um, over to ACES for VFC. So Chris is saying, if you have an EMR to ACES interface, then that COVID vaccine will go. But if they don't have the funding source correct, it will not decrement in your ACES inventory. So same thing Maggie said, just a little bit different words. Correct. Um, so we need to create new facilities for our organization for our COVID vaccine clinics. This is for online scheduling purposes. Would we need to register the facilities and get a new name or a new ID, even if it's the same address? Do you see they're that? Different, they're different facilities in the same address location. Each one will have um, their own COVID vaccines. Is that correct? If so, they would have to onboard those facilities, even if they have the same address. So Elizabeth, do you have any follow-up questions for that? If you wanna unmute yourself, I wanna make sure that that got answered. All right, well, if you do, make sure that you email us because that onboarding process, you're going to want to start that soon. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, and Rebecca, just additional things about Lisa's question. Um, it, is, it is a question if you, uh, if you need a COVID pin, uh, will you receive uh, ship, vaccine shipments there or you just want to have a facility for reporting purposes? Uh, maybe even you don't. We don't have to create new facilities if, if everything is uh, going from the same address. Uh, yeah, please let us go ahead. This is Lisbeth. Sorry, I couldn't unmute myself quick enough. <laughs> um, the actual shipments are still coming to the same facilities. It's it's just a facility in our EHR system, so we can do online scheduling. Um, so we had to make some uh, adjustments on the setup in our EHR. So. Um, it is the same registered address. We already have a COVID pin. Uh, and because we're only going to be administering um, COVID vaccines from that EMR or EHR facility, I just wanted to uh, make sure that I'm going to send um, Maggie a list of the current facilities. So it's all on your database as well. But when I was doing that, I was wondering, do I need it to register this new facility, even though it's got the same um, information. We only need it for internal purposes, really, uh, for scheduling. Uh, but I wanted to make sure that if we add the pin, the COVID pin to those new facilities, that it still would decrement and, um, you know, be added to, to the database. Um, I guess, I mean, so we... that will be, I understand, and uh, that will be mapping on your EHR uh, mm -hmm. side, basically. 
So if, if you want to have multiple facilities and all of them are reporting the same SIS client ID that is attached to the COVID pin that you have the inventory there, uh, then all of them will be transmitted to that specific location, regardless how many uh, different facilities you have internally on your part. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think okay. the only uh, thing to consider is if we were to change an address, right? So if it's a different location, then at that point it would have to be a, a new facility that needs to be registered if it was a different location. Like a new location. Um, and again, you, you kind of have to um, administer the vaccines from where they physically are. Uh -huh. um, so if it is a different address, um, yeah, you can send us an email and and we can we can think think through this. Uh -huh. Yeah. I mean, and that's not the case right now. Um, I just, you know, I'm just thinking ahead if we needed to do that. But um, yeah, no, definitely. I'll, I'll send uh, the update just so you, you guys have that information on in your database as well. But um, yeah, no, thank you. That's that's helpful. One person said they have a small handful of vaccine reporting that did not reflect on the patient record on ACES. The EMR expert said that it did export correctly. Can they manually enter those? They can manually enter those or they can have their EHR vendor and see if they can resend the information. Thanks. So, so start with your EHR vendor, your EMR vendor, and then can we just put in the chat the manual, the guide for manual data entry again? I know that that comes up a lot. If it didn't already get put in there. Yeah, uh, my advice uh, is always to go through uh, resend the, resending the data that you already put in your EHR just to eliminate the double work. Uh, and sometimes it, it is just, uh, you know, changing something on your end that uh, will transmit the data properly. Uh, kind of a similar question, we're experiencing issues with our EHR system. Are we able to upload our ACES info into the system using Excel or CSV files? No. No. Yeah, that would be a short, short answer. Okay. And then there's a comment that um, they're having some trouble getting in touch with the help desk, um, difficulties reaching them. What's the best way to move forward if they're not getting a response? The best way is just um, emailing them. They're trying to go as quickly and as diligent through those emails. We are just in hard times right now and we're trying to get to them. All right, any other final kind of questions around ACES? I feel like we got some new questions this time, which is good. That means that new people are um, getting into ACES. So getting doses in and ordering them. Any other final questions around ACES? This is Lisbeth. I, I have one more question for Maggie and her team. Uh, for the interface, we actually have the, the bi-directional bi interface, right? So we're getting the inbound and, and, and sending information out. So I was just wondering, I know this question came up earlier on the multiple patients found, right? So it's hard to match a patient. Um, would we be able to um, customize the interface message that comes in with more identifiers when we have those situations? Because it sounds like, you know, if we, we only see for our software, which is eClinical Works, we only see first name, last name, date of birth, and guarantor or guardian. And many times they all match, you know, especially if there's, you know, a lot of baby boy, baby girl uh, with the same last name. So is that a request that I could uh, put in through our, our EHR vendor and work with ACES to see if more identifiers can come through on those inbound messages?
Mm, I wouldn't know how to answer that, Valentina, because that would be more on their EHR side. Okay. Well, I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna, I I'm gonna answer for, them because I think this would be helpful for our staff to try to match and link up the right patient when we're pulling in historicals. Yeah, I agree. But uh, having more parameters sent in the query message that you and that your EHR sends uh, will be more beneficial to try to find a match to the proper patient in ASIC. Uh -huh. There, um, there's another one, Maggie and Valentine, around around multiples, so uh, around twins. So how they just want to know why patients get merged or overloaded when the only thing common is a date of birth. Birth order is in, but next time the shots are given, one twin is gone again, and the name has been changed over to the other twin. So I'll want to I'll want to answer the second one first because twins cannot say twins if uh, if they have uh, very similar information um, and especially if the names are very close uh, close looking to one to another uh, there is a field there is a field that. Uh, indicates uh, a birth order uh, and uh, if you talk to your EHR uh, to start sending that information um, that will be helpful for uh, for anyone and just indicating that uh, which twin is twin A, twin B or first or second in, in the birth order uh, and it's not only you but everyone that reports information about that twin has to kind of uh, uh, increase the data quality of, of everything that is being sent. Uh, because sometimes we we receive only the first letter from the name, from the first name. And for twins, that, may, that might be the same information. And if you take into account that everything else is the same, uh, ACES will think that those are one and the same patient. Regarding the first one, um, I kind of, would need more information about this. Maybe on the front end, uh, when you compare them, they, the only thing similar is the date of birth. But the structure in ACES is that ACES is keeping uh, reserve records for every patient. That means that everything that gets reported for any patient is in that reserve table and the master table only shows the most recent record. So if and when ACES is comparing for duplicates, it is comparing that reserve record. So maybe at some point, uh, something was reported for those two patients that is uh, more similar. Um, I don't know, maybe um, address or something that will trigger ACES to think that those are one and the same patient. Thanks. I hope this helps. Thank you. All right, we are out of out of time. Um, please make sure you continue to send us your ACES questions and Maggie and Valentine and Angela can get to them. There was a question that popped up in the chat about a pediatrician who wants to do parents. And since next week we're, we're talking about adolescents, um, I'd love to bring that to the group. So if you're a practice, a pediatric practice who's already been doing parents, please let us know so we can ask you to just kind of share a little bit about how what you've learned along the way. Do you need to add them to your EMR? Do you not need to add them to your EMR? How's the billing work? Do you bill out a network? Uh, just a couple tips and tricks so that that office can get started. So, so next week we'll hear all about ad vaccinating adolescents against COVID-19 and all the other diseases that we need them to get vaccinated for. And please try and get those teens to their doctor's offices or to one of the another Pfizer event hosted by a, a, by a pharmacy or a state pod, uh, help us get to herd immunity. So thanks everybody. Have a good week. Thank you.